Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a leather sheath with some very unconventional tools. So last week I made a pair of skein dubes, those are uh, Scottish knives, and for one of them I made a leather sheath. Now for this video I'm not going to be using any leather working tools uh, to speak of. So if there's a general point to this video, and maybe there's not really one, maybe this is just me having fun, but I really actually do believe that it's uh, you know, an important thing to be able to go out to your shop and make stuff with whatever you've got. So in this particular case, you know, I'll be making a leather sheath, but not using any leather working tools. All right, I'm not going to give away how I'm going to do this. I'll just jump right into it and you can see how I went about it. There are a number of ways to make a leather sheath. Pouch sheaths, layered leather sheaths, scabbard types with wooden cores, and so on. This one will be made from several layers of leather with a welt. I'll be starting with a piece of vegetable tanned cowhide. Thanks to Kai Harrison who provided this to me on short notice. Much appreciated. Anyway, leather comes in two general types, vegetable and chemical tanned leather. For this type of sheath, you'll want the vegetable tanned type. The blade I'll be making this for is a skein dube. If you haven't seen it, I did a video about the making of this blade last week. Links in the cards and description. Now one of the dirty little secrets of leather work is that the single thing that most distinguishes a good looking sheath or holster from a relatively amateurish one is the quality of the stitching. If the holes or stitches are uneven, it looks uh, crappy. One way to fix that is using a high quality stitching machine like a Tipman or something similar that's intended specifically for leather work. Now I don't do a lot of leather work, so I don't own one. Now if you want to do this totally by hand, you can use little handheld gizmos for marking the holes at regular intervals called overstitch wheels, which are extremely inexpensive. And you can use awls and stitching hole groovers and punches, and suffice it to say there are all kinds of hand tools that will help you do the job without spending much money. But today I'll be turning the overkill knob to 11. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Using a CNC machine to stitch a sheath, clown move bro, as baseball superstar Bryce Harper would say it. Hey, look, I'm not defending this. I'm just using a tool that I happen to enjoy using. If I'm illustrating anything useful here, and let's face it, maybe I'm not, but let's just say that I am, it's that there are certain tools that you end up using way more than you ever thought you might because they're just versatile tools. So I hope you'll take this video kind of in the spirit that it's offered. You know, a lot of times when I do things with CNC machines, I'll get objections from people who say, well, I don't have a CNC machine. How do you expect me to do this project? So I may be kind of beating this point to death, but I really do believe that, you know, every machine, every tool has more uses than you think it does. A good belt grinder is that kind of tool too. Show me a knife maker and I'll show you a guy who can make a spaceship with a belt grinder. Once you get familiar with that tool, you can do all kinds of things you never anticipated. My point is that just because you don't have conventional tools for doing X, Y, or Z, don't assume you can't make something. Now we happen to be using a kind of ridiculous tool here for this particular job. You know, could I have laid this out with a kindergarten ruler and an eight penny nail? Sure, but I did it this way. Learn to handle a tool well and you'll find a million uses for it. Anyhow, I'll be using Fusion 360 to offset a line from the design I originally used for making this knife. Then I'll lay a pattern of circles down that path, extrude a row of holes, mirror them onto a second line, and I've got a row of stitch holes running perfectly parallel to the edge of my knife. Back in the real world, I'll cut three layers of leather and stack them. So two will be the back and front of the sheath, and one will be for the welt, the spacer that's sandwiched in the middle of the sheath. The back piece will be cut much longer than the other two to provide for the belt loop. Next, I'll set the sandwich of leather up on my Tormach. 
I'll be squashing it underneath a layer of Delrin plastic, which will allow me to fixture it securely. If I had to clamp this directly on the leather, it would imprint clamp marks into the leather, and on top of that, wouldn't clamp worth a hoot either. Things would shift around and the whole thing would get bollocked up. Using a 3 32nd inch drill, I'll fire up the Tormach and drill the holes. If you're just looking at it, compared to the thread that you're going to be using, a 3 32nd inch hole looks pretty huge. But I'll give you a demonstration a little later why I like to use this size of hole. And here's the result. Next, I'll cut everything to the rough size of the final product. As in all things I do, I leave extra room to allow for screw ups. The interior of the welt, though, will be cut to exact shape now so as to mate perfectly with the blade. The welt, by the way, has two functions. First, to protect the stitches from getting cut by the blade, and second, to give a little extra space in which the blade will sit. Now, this is a really crucial aspect of timing. If you're going to make a belt loop that's situated in a way that requires it to be stitched on the inside of the sheath, you better do it now. Otherwise, you can't get to the stitches. Of course, I would never have screwed up and done it in the wrong order and had to tear the sheath up and then redo it. That would be idiotic. Anyway, if you're doing one like this, where the stitching's exposed, you can do it now or you can do it later and it doesn't really matter. Before I stitch it though, I'll use this little knife to skive the leather, which is leather work speak for thinning that leather out and putting a sort of bevel on it. This makes the joint slimmer and smoother. Now there are skiving knives specifically made for doing this, but that would be contrary to the theme of this whole project, wouldn't it? So, I'm just using this little shop blade that I use for all sorts of things. Now, there are a million ways to stick leather together, including a lot of specialized adhesives marketed for leather work. I'm just using 3M industrial double-sided tape. Whatever adhesive you use, it'll keep the layers of leather stable so that things won't shift around and your holes won't get out of alignment. Okay, so this time, no CNC, I'll just be drilling the holes on my mill drill. Like I said, for illustrative purposes, I'll be showing what using a 1 16th inch hole does on this particular set of stitches. If you look at the drill in comparison to the needle, it looks like you got plenty of room. I like to put a first application of leather dye on the sheath now. Thick leather like this really drinks up the dye, so a couple of applications are usually required no matter what order you do it in. But by doing the first application before the stitching, you're assured that all the leather is covered and there won't be little gaps in the coverage around the stitches. I'll be using the so-called two-needle method to stitch it up. See, here's the problem with the 1 16th inch hole. The leather expands and it takes a lot of effort to get these big needles through a 1 16th inch hole. Doable, but a big pain in the neck. Now you can make them go through easier by waxing them with beeswax, but if the hole's too small, doesn't matter what you do, it's still going to be a struggle. Now I'll go ahead and stitch up the sheath itself. 
way easier with these larger 332nd inch holes than the 1 16th inch hole. You can see that I'm using a little piece of wire to line up the holes so that they don't get out of whack as I use the double-sided tape to stick it together and assemble it. Again, I'm using the two needle method with the thread going through each hole twice so that the two strands cross over each other over, under, over, under on each stitch. As a knife maker, I'm required by union rules to use my belt grinder on each and every project I do. So here, a little judicious application of the grinder is required to even things up around the edges. Then, a final coat of leather dye with special attention to all the undyed edges. Finally, I'll apply some of this handy water sealing glop. A little buffing and we're good to go. So yesterday I got a chance to hang out with some of the guys from Tormach, the folks that made the uh, CNC machine that I use. They were down in Atlanta to go to the Fabtech uh, convention, which is a big convention for fabricators, welders. So we were kind of reflecting on the uses of CNC machines for knife makers. And I'm really a big believer that there are just a million uses for a CNC machine. A lot of people, I've said this in a bunch of different videos, but a lot of people are under the impression that when you make something using CNC, it's just press a big button and some perfect product pops out and there's sort of no human intervention required. There's no, um, you know, handwork or whatever. It's very much not like that. Um, the way that I view a CNC machine is that it gives you an opportunity to automate some of the things that um, are just drudgery and, and this is actually a really good case in this, this particular case, CNC machines allow you to do certain kinds of operations, drilling holes at regular uh, intervals being one of those, that uh, is just very, very difficult to do by hand. So the most important thing here is not that I was able to do something faster than I could have done it by hand. Honestly, it really wasn't faster at all. It might have even been slower. But what I was able to do was increase the quality of the final product by placing the holes in a really regular um, and uh, attractive way. Anyway, I'll get off the soapbox now. See you soon and uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching guys. 
If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!